Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a lovely fall day at Royal City Nursery. Um, contrary to the uh, forecast, it's not raining today, so what a perfect day to be closing our pond. These days are going to become few and far between, so we don't want to pass them up. Um, we're going to close a fairly large koi pond today, and what I want to show you is some of the tools you might need, some of the products you might need to, uh, to get the water prepared for winter, and then some of the um, methods of keeping the fish safe for the winter time. Uh, on another video, we're going to show you how to clean the pump, uh, but we'll try to keep this one just to what you can do today uh, while the weather's nice, and uh, doing this while you enjoy it still, not when it's snowing out and it's really not very fun. Feel free to call us if it gets to that point. We'll suffer through it, but we'll get it done for you. <clears throat> So first thing we have to do really, uh, because there is some waiting for pro processes to happen, is we want to get the pump pulled out first. Um, we may have to lower the water level in some ponds, so while we're waiting for water to drain, we can be doing other things to shorten the process as much as we can. So in this pond we have, we have both a skimmer and up at the top end of it we have a spillway. So we have to make sure first and foremost that the water is out of all of the plumbing that runs to that. Because inevitably, one of the biggest uh, challenges we have in the spring, if we get a call that my waterfall is leaking, is a pipe hasn't been drained of all its water. And in the wintertime when it freezes, it bursts the pipe. And now we have to start digging up and moving rocks and so forth to find out where the, where the failure happens. So if we winterize it properly, we can avoid all of that. So this is probably the most uncomfortable part of the process. Um, I don't have my coat on right now, I just have a sweatshirt with my sleeves rolled up. I'm kneeling on something dry and warm while I can, and I have something to dry myself off with because this is going to be cold. There's no sugar coating this. So we'd have to uh, take the skimmer basket out on this system. I've already actually taken it out once today to clean some of the leaves out of it because we're under a Norway maple here. You can just set that aside. This is the, the icky part, is I need to pull the media out of the filter. So in this case, it's just one of these pieces of coarse foam. You've probably pulled this out through the summer many times. We're gonna leave this out this time. So once we pull this out, we're gonna clean this out. You could do this inside in, the, uh, in a laundry tub or, or something where the water's warmer, it's a little nicer. That could just be kept in your garage all winter. Then this is where it's, you gotta make sure you can pull your sleeve up far enough. Um, we'd reach in, this has a, a fitting in the side of the pond, or a basin, and the pump is down in the bottom. So a lot of the Aquascape pumps come with a, a threaded fitting that we can undo the pump from, or in some of the ponds we've installed, uh, we put a, a union, uh, and I, I have a valve that has a sample of that I can show you later, but um, we'd have to reach down in here, unthread the piece of pipe that's down in the bottom, and then pull out our pump. So the threaded piece that was on this is still in there. <clears throat> now there's another section of pipe in here we also have to unthread. Because what I need to be able to do is get this to the point where I can get these fittings above the water. Because right now I can't drain the water out of this because it's below water level. I'm going to take this piece out as well because it just keeps trying to float on me and getting in my way. This piece doesn't need to go inside for the winter. This could just stay in the basin. Frost isn't going to hurt that. So now I've got the piece that comes out of the side of the, uh, the basin removed. So now there's just a hole in the side of the basin that's below water. <clears throat> now next I need my pump. So I use a fairly large pump when I service these because I want this part to go as fast as possible. So this pump's pumping 3,000 gallons an hour, which is more than that pump by far. <clears throat> I could also take one of the uh, accessory fittings that comes with the Aquascape pumps and hook a, another piece of uh, plumbing onto this and use the pump I just pulled out to help me drain the water. So you don't need to buy another pump to do it. So now a big pump like this, one of the things I can't stress enough if you ever are putting a, 
a larger pump into a pond, don't lift them by the cord because you can cause a failure in the seal at the top of the pump. And trust me, I've been shocked by these before. It's not fun. So I just need to remove enough water to get the, the side wall fitting below, or to get the water level below that fitting because I need it out of the water in order to drain all the water out of it. right cord you end up with a bit of a cord management issue doing some of these things because we got cords all over the place now if you are draining pond water pond water is fantastic fertilized water even so if you can pump it into a garden uh, without washing out too much that's a great space to dump uh, pond water, especially in the spring when we're pumping out some of the, uh, maybe the mucky debris that's left on the bottom of the pond after winter. That's the best fertilizer you can get. I think we sell a sea compost that's basically pond goo in a bag. <clears throat> so we're just gonna leave this for a few minutes. Uh, we are gonna be mindful of it because we do have fish in here. We don't want the water level to get so low that the fish are gonna have trouble. So I need to remove about four inches of water from this pond. So with the size of this pond, that's probably about 500 gallons. <clears throat> so one of the things we do have to watch for this time of year, and I only brought fish food out because I can't stress enough that you really have to stop feeding your fish this time of year. The fish will keep trying to eat it, but once the water level drops below about 50 degrees, uh, I guess that's Fahrenheit. <clears throat> I think that's around 15 or 13 Celsius. The fish can't digest the food anymore. Even the cold water fish. So this is uh, just a this is a premium cold water fish food, but it's still for say between 50 and 60 degrees. Once we get up into around 70 degrees, we can switch to uh, the summer feed. But if the fish eat this and can't digest it, it causes their digestive system to to bloat and swell up, and it can actually kill the fish. So as much as you want to see your fish coming to the surface, still you want them to survive the winter. So time to put the fish food away. This keeps fairly well as long as you keep it in a cool, dry place indoor somewhere. Um, ideally not in your garden shed, indoor somewhere. <clears throat> a lot of these bags have a Ziploc closer on them now, so they stay fairly airtight for the winter. Mice will eat this if you leave it somewhere where mice can get. <clears throat> I mentioned that uh, union that sometimes we'll put on the top of the pumps. So in, the, in line in the plumbing sometimes, if we're building a pond, we often install a, a fitting that's similar to this, maybe without the blue valve on it. And we just have to unthread it, take it apart, and one part stays attached to the plumbing, one part stays attached to the pump. Now something else we're going to need for this time of year is what we carry is a micro lift, winter and fall and winter prep. So what this is doing is it's, we're changing the enzymes that are available in the pond this time of year. Um, a lot of the bacteria and, and so forth that we have and microorganisms that are in the pond in the summertime when it's warm become inactive or even die through the winter. So since we, we don't want an accumulation of organic matter and waste products, we can change the biological activity in the pond a little bit by adding a, a cold water suitable product. And this even, some of these act, stay active even when the water's basically frozen or near frozen. So down around 35 degrees. We also have a couple of uh, other products here, pond detoxifier, detoxifier and fountain maintenance. So some of these can be used for, let's say we drain our pond too far and we have to refill it. Uh, we, we have to treat the water that we put back in. If you're on city water, we're on well water here, so we don't have the uh, chloramines and chlorines in our water. But um, these also contain a product that helps uh, relieve the uh, stress on the fish. <coughs> So sometimes the more activity you have going on in a pond, you can get your fish really stressed out and anxious. And uh, their immune system, again, is diminished this time of year. So uh, a comfortable fish, a non-stressed out fish, will tolerate all the, the mucking around you're doing in their, uh, in their world better if they're not stressed out. 
There's not a lot you can do as far as cleaning the pond this time of year. Right, just keeping an eye on my water level there. Having a net available to get some of the floating debris out. You want to get as much of it as you can this time of year. Um, we typically end up cleaning more in the spring because inevitably over the winter we get a bunch of debris falling in that we can't control through the winter months. But a coarse net's pretty good for this because the leaves are usually pretty big and if we catch too many leaves in the fine, we have a, a net that's made of a fine white mesh, um, it holds so much weight and so much, so much water that you could actually break your net. This net lets a lot more water go through. Try to make sure I don't trip myself on my own netting. So while the pump's doing its thing, we could even be going down to the bottom, scooping leaves right off the bottom. Right, fish. So this can be about the most time consuming part of the whole process is, is cleaning as much debris out as you can. I like wearing boots doing this because I feel I'm less likely to slide in the pond if I'm wearing good footwear. So a lot of this organic matter, if you don't get as much out as you can, it does keep decomposing through the winter time. So this is where the microbe lives. organic matter from leaf litter and, and so forth, even environmental grime dust that's blowing in. Even though the snow looks nice and white when it first falls, you've all seen the snow after it starts to melt, not so nice and white anymore. So all of that grime is ending up in your pond. Not a bad idea, and I don't have one with me, to have a pail or bucket handy as you're doing this. So now I'm going to have to go clean those up later. And also, and I'm going to be setting this up a little bit uh, later, our Norway maple that's above this pond hasn't dropped most of its leaves yet. So actually the amount of leaves in the pond is not bad. Uh, last year the leaves accumulated deep enough I could use a leaf blower to blow the top six inches off the pond. So when this tree lets go of its leaves, it's kind of like a heavy snowfall. I'll end up with this much leaf cover. So we can also put a fine net over top of the pond. So to hold this uh, netting down, we just have these little uh, these little metal staples. Some pond netting kits come with little plastic spikes. These are the same kind of spike we'd use to hold down landscape fabric or even saw it on a steep slope. We could use a few rocks to help hold the pond or the, the net down. <clears throat> but you still may have to occasionally clean the leaves off this because this will end up with such a continuous layer of leaves on top that it can actually be hard on the fish not getting them enough oxygen <clears throat> and of course the more it accumulates the heavier it gets so cleaning it off periodically isn't a bad thing it's often a two-person process so if I had four inches of leaves on this I'd probably have to have two of us pull the thing back like we're pulling the uh, sheet off a bed and hopefully pull all the leaves off with it <clears throat> so I'm probably going to put some kind of a cable up over this to help tent it a little bit over to get the leaves to shed a little bit. Because if there's one thing these Norway maples make a mess of is ponds. Um, something else we have on this side of the pond, just going to watch the sander doesn't back up into a rock, is if you have any pond plants that aren't winter hardy, this is the time of year to take them out. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't had a heavy frost yet. You'd be It'd be pretty obvious if we had a heavy frost, which plants were going to tolerate the winter and which ones weren't. Uh, so things like canna lily cannot tolerate the winter. We do have a marsh marigold in here that can tolerate the winter. So what I'm going to do with it is I'm going to make sure it's in enough water that the pot's below the surface. And in the spring, I'll pull it back up to a shallower spot where it wants to stay. But canna lilies, definitely not suitable for uh, the winter. So some of these you can keep in a tub of water all winter. Um, you could actually let them dry out a bit. They're really not much different than the canna lilies you plant in your uh, planters. So you can get the, uh, the root of this to overwinter and, and restart it late spring. So we're going to be putting this indoors for the winter time.
will pull back just enough here that I can get at my March Marigold. So now the water on the surface can freeze all at once in the winter time and he'll be fine. almost there we're just at the uh, height of the fitting now so I want it just a little bit below so when I drain it I don't have to worry about any water going back um, something else we could probably get out before we uh, get too far along or to get ready beforehand if you are have leaving a pond running all winter so I have some winters left this pond running you still want to leave a backup um, resource in it for making sure the water can't freeze completely um, I do have live fish in here so if the pump stopped running for any reason through the winter time, February is no time to be out here trying to figure out how do I get a hole in the ice so that I don't uh, have all my fish uh, succumb to the, the frozen surface in the winter time. Uh, not a good idea to take an axe or anything or a hammer to break the ice in the winter time. Because imagine um, if you were in the air, we can't hardly feel it. You, you feel the, uh, the boom when we hear lightning strike in the air it's a whole lot worse for a fish if it's in liquid. So if we're to hit the ice in the winter time with something, you effectively just punched your fish. They're not gonna thank you for it. So you could actually give them a concussion from using something like a hammer or an ax to break a hole in the ice. So you're better to have some means even floating in there beforehand, like a pond heater, just in case your pump stops working. So the pump itself will keep the water circulating. It'll keep a certain amount of uh, amount of the surface from freezing over completely but even if this is just floating in there before your pump fails you can always turn it on after the after you notice the pump stopped working and this will melt a hole back in the ice wherever this is floating but you don't want to again take it at hammer and break a hole in the ice and then put this in <clears throat> another nice backup in the winter time I like to use is an aerator Oh, the pucks for this are off. So these little air stones floating in the water, all they do is pump a little bit of air under the ice. And as long as that air can escape, it's keeping the ammonia and methane and some of the other gases from building up under the ice. It's that ammonia and methane building up that can actually make the water extremely toxic in the wintertime. So trying to keep that reduced will help your fish survive. Your fish are really just going to sit on the bottom. They they practically go dormant in the winter time, but toxic gas levels could uh, could cause their demise. So again, this will also help keep the surface of the ice from freezing completely. So this is probably the cheapest method to run. This will actually melt a bigger area. So it's not uncommon where the the, the bubbles are coming up in the ice for it to still freeze over at some point. But imagine if if the air wasn't escaping somewhere around the pond, your pond would blow up like a balloon. So even that air going up under the ice, it's still escaping somewhere. Um, so it's doing its job even if the surface freezes over what looks to you to be solid. Whereas with the uh, pond heater, you'll actually see a, a, a space in the ice where the uh, water's not frozen. And I'm gonna turn my pump off because we're getting a little bit, a little bit low there. So I don't know if you can see down into this uh, basin very well with the, the light we have, but there's a couple of fittings in the side of the pond. This one on, I guess it'd be your left, is uh, the overflow. So this goes to a pipe somewhere else. Your basin may not even have one of those. The, the fitting on the other side of this one is the one that goes from the pump to the waterfall. So this is the one I need to get all the water out of because somewhere between here and at the top, I may have low points in my pipe and if the water sits in those, it's guaranteed to freeze and burst the pipe. <clears throat> this overflow one, I can just remove. You could even leave this one in all winter because really all that's going to happen is a little bit of water that trickles over the edge of this is going to run down the pipe. But if you're worried about uh, how 
if there's any depressions in your pipe because that's the problem is if if your pipe does this somewhere along its length the water could sit completely in that depression in the pipe and freeze and burst the pipe so i could even i could winterize this as well if your pond just fills up to overflowing that's not going to hurt anything now the next part of this is typically done with a wet dry shop vacuum so if you don't have one um, possibly you could borrow one from somebody or this is often when we get called because if you don't have all the equipment or if you only would ever use it for this type of thing once a year um, you may not want to store one just so that you can clean the uh, water lines of your pond out <clears throat> so if you were working for a pool company they would do a very similar thing or if you had a, a pool um, they have a very expensive version of this. A, a blower for pool lines is probably about two or three thousand dollars. So we don't have one of those either because we don't blow enough lines. One of those. But like anything else we're using outside, the other thing you want to watch is that you're plugging all of this equipment into a ground fault protected electrical outlet, similar to the ones you might have in your bathroom that have the little button in the middle because if you're working in the pond with things that plug in or with motors, um, you do want to make sure you're protected from electrical shock <clears throat> because you're basically filling a motor up over here with water and you're holding on to the other end. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure how much we're going to be able to hear while I do this because the shop back's a little noisy. So whether I vacuum this line out or blow this line out, it really doesn't matter which way I go. <clears throat> if I went to the top of the pond and blew it out, I'd be forcing all the water back to the bottom. Or from the bottom, I could vacuum it out from the top. Because at least gravity is helping me a little bit then. Now, I can't remember how long this pipe is. And it's a big pipe that I've placed in here. So it could I might even fill the shop back once doing it. So here goes the noise. want to check my vacuum before I get it completely full. Now as long as you see the pump the pipe kind of jumping around there that's telling me that it's still sucking bits of water. If Once I've got this line free of as much water as I can there the any water that's still in the pipe has enough space in the pipe to let the water flow past it freely. If it's still kind of chugging along then it still means there's too much water in the line and it is full. Make sure I'm not pouring that on my cord. So I probably have about 30 or 40 feet of two inch pipe. So it's not surprising that this more than filled the shop back. Notice in here, I also took, if you have one of these vacuums, they might have a filter on them for vacuuming sawdust or drywall dust, that sort of thing. You have to take that off to vacuum this sort of thing or those paper filters will just disintegrate. Some of them have a foam filter that covers this as well. of the waterfall and see if I can hear the air flowing freely into the uh, spillway. Again, this is something you could do while that's doing its thing. You could be doing something else. So again, this media, I could take out this time of year. I could take this into the laundry room and clean this out reasonably well and just leave it sit dry for the winter time.
This piece of plastic could stay in the basin all winter. Ice isn't going to hurt this. And I don't know if uh, Cassandra can see, but in this basin, and if you have one of these on either side, there's a there's a two inch round fitting. And right now I can hear the air flowing nice and freely through that fitting. So that tells me that I'm pretty certain that this pipe is free of any water. So even after letting that run the second time, how much water did we get? So I'd only filled it up about a third full the second time. So <clears throat> on some of these vacuums, you could take this off and put it on the other side and make a blower out of the same vacuum. Now, depending on what your plumbing size is, I don't have all the pieces down here with me. Let's see how small this one goes. But sometimes some of these Aquascape fittings have three or four sizes of tubing. So it could be that you, to make this fit into the, whatever size piece of plumbing you have, you take one of the accessory fittings that you had from Aquascape and you tape it to the end of your vacuum to make the hose the size that will fit in whatever your plumbing size is. This happens to be a two inch fitting here, so this fits in it no problem. I don't need to get all the water out of the bottom of the basin. That's just going to fill back up again over winter. <clears throat> but now again, depending on what size of plumbing you have, you may need a variety of different sizes of rubber stoppers. You have little tiny plumbing, you might need little tiny ones. Um, some of these you can find at your average Home Depot. Some of them we stock. <clears throat> so if you have standard uh, inch and a half or two inch threaded fittings in your in your plumbing, these you can get almost anywhere. So stock this year can be a bit of a challenge. So we're not offended if somebody goes to a, another vendor to get something because of stock issues. <clears throat> But I think this one takes a two inch fitting. So on this, I don't know if you can see, there's a little rubber washer on it. Now I could also use uh, uh, plumber's tape or I could use pipe dope. Uh, so if you if you have anybody in the family that's uh, that does plumbing, those would all be very familiar to them. But we basically need to seal this threaded fitting to the threaded fitting that's in the side of the, the pond or I could take a corresponding rubber stopper and squeeze that in. And then on these, there's a rubber nut or a nut on the end of them. So as I squeeze this, I don't know if you'd be able to see it on this. It slowly makes the, the fitting fatter. So I'm doing the same thing as this uh, seal is doing or the uh, plumber's tape would do. So no water can get around that fitting anymore. For argument's sake, I'll use this one on the other side. So no water could get in the overflow. <clears throat> now I know when I put the pipe in for mine, it runs downhill all the way. I made sure when I put it in that I didn't need to vacuum it out. <clears throat> now correspondingly, I'll go up to the top and I'll see if I have another one of these big rubber stoppers. I prefer the rubber stoppers over the threaded fittings. These I find get brittle over time and sometimes break. The rubber stoppers I find do a little better. You can also get these at a, often at a pool supplier. Challenge this year will be if they only have enough for winterizing their own pools, are they gonna part with any? <clears throat> so I'm gonna go back to the top. So now in the bottom of this one, Don't sit on that. So now all the way from the spillway all the way to the skimmer, there's no water in that pipe. And if there is, it's very little. You could have a half inch or an inch of water freeze inside a two inch pipe and that won't burst the pipe. There's plenty of airspace still. But right now, I, no matter how much rain and snow I get in this basin, it's not gonna get into that pipe. They even make the shape of these basins such that they're wedge shaped towards the top. So as ice starts to push, it starts to push up as opposed to push out. 
Now, depending on how warm and comfortable it is outside, you could wash all of this off nice. You're going to have to wash it off again in the spring anyway, so timing might suggest that, you know what, I can leave this for the winter time and I can make it all nice in the spring when it's, you know, when we get those warm April days and we, we're dying to get out into our garden. <clears throat> that could be the time of year to get all this even nicer. We can put that back because ice isn't going to hurt it. We can put this back because ice isn't going to hurt it. And basically the spillway is ready for winter. I don't have to really do anything to it. These I was going to take inside and clean them out. And then I could just let these dry out for the winter and store them in a garbage bag. Now, same thing down at the bottom. This can stay in the pond for the winter. There's no, there's no percentage in taking this out. You see some of this uh, grime that's built up on this. Some of that's just because I have really hard water. And in a, a, a future video, we're going to show you how to clean some of that debris out of a pump. Because this calcium buildup on a pump can really be hard on the pump. It's probably our, I would say it's our number one reason for pumps failing is because there's a lot of calcium buildup. And next to age, I guess. If a pump is uh, nowadays getting six or eight years old, that's probably a pretty good lifespan for a, a, a submersible pump for a pond. But with a little bit of care, you can make it last even longer. See, it's not nearly as cold now because I lowered the water level so far. The skimmer basket can go back in. So the fall closing can actually go fairly quick because we don't need to get the water pristine this time of year. We can put the lid back on that. That just keeps excessive debris from getting into the skimmer. Now again, to pull my pump out here, I, I tie a string onto it. They put a handle on the pumps, but that usually means you have to get in the water to get it. See how many cores I've got tangled up on what here? So it's not a bad idea if you have some kind of little Tupperware containers of some kind or, or bins to have a bin that's just for your pond equipment and try to keep it for one for what stuff you took out and then you could use the same basin in the spring when you take the stoppers and things out to put them back in. If you have uh, surplus products that you've kept over the years, it's a good idea to keep those separate from what you used the previous fall to the next spring. Because it's, uh, it's amazing how we go to some ponds to do some service on them and we get given this tub of miscellaneous. And then there's a whole lot of time spent trying to sort out what the heck goes with what. <clears throat> but if you know this came out of the pond this year, then next spring you know this goes back in and the stoppers you took out go back in the same basin. So it's sort of a spring fall opening box. <clears throat> Something else to be aware of with the, any plumbing, if you have any valves, even the little tiny aquascape uh, pumps sometimes come with a little tiny ball valve to adjust the flow in your pond. In the winter time, and I don't know if you can see inside that, right now this valve is closed. And if I turn it that way, it's open. But if this is left in the closed position, inside that ball valve, there's a little ball of water. So if I leave it there, this is the second place I often find failures is somebody has left this ball valve closed through the winter time and that little ball of water inside freezes and bursts the valve. So this is a pretty big one. This is about $100 to replace one of these. So just turning the valve to open is a great way to save that. Never mind all the labor to cut it out and put in a new one. These Aquascape Air Stones, they come with a ton of airline. You don't need to leave it as long as this. This is uh, out of a an even uh, larger pond than this one. The one thing I have found in some rural properties is squirrels love to eat the tubing. So you might have to put a piece of uh, garden hose or something over top of the tubing to prevent squirrels and chipmunks from chewing on it. It's disappointing to go out in December and find out your air stone's not working because a squirrel was snacking. Get these kits with one air stone or two air stones. Little fish. all 
I'll tangle that. If you get a kink in this tubing, it won't let the air through. So you really do have to watch that they're not, uh, not overly bent. This one looks like it's kinked a little bit right here where it goes in. So if it's bent like this, it won't work. So I'm going to pull that off. Not leave my debris lap around. Push it back on so now there's no more kink. And both air stones are now bubbling away. So wherever there's air bubbling up to the surface, during mild weather, you'll probably have a free space in the ice because that's circulating slightly warmer water as well up to the surface. Um, you don't want to put these necessarily the deepest part of the pond because you don't want the pond water to get as cold as the surface all the way to the bottom. That could be where your fish are hiding out is down in the deeper part. <clears throat> It's not a bad idea with these, uh, some of these air pumps uh, to cover them up, again, in a little Tupperware container or to put a pot upside down on them. Um, some air stones are rated for outdoor use, some aren't. So just make sure you read the packaging to see if it's designed for outdoor use. If it's not, then you could at least put it inside of a, a waterproof container to keep it from getting wet through the winter time. So if you had a smaller pond, you could cut a lot of this tubing so you didn't have to worry about all the excess in your pond. And then you could just keep the spare for if the squirrels did bite through it in the winter time, you'd have a spare piece to uh, put in line. Now, as far as the water heater goes, I often will put this close to where the air lines go into the pond. Cause the other challenge you can have, um, we're on a rural power grid where we are. So if the power goes out for any significant period of time, even where the air lines go into the pond could freeze. So one way I could thaw the air lines is with the pond heater. So right now I only have one power supply out to where I'm working. So ideally you would have to, there would be enough power on your, a normal outdoor circuit on a house likely to run both the heater and the air pump. But I don't like leaving these plugged in all the time because if I'm to look at the label here, this is using 300 watts of power nearly all the time. So if I only, the Airstone is using only maybe 15 or 20 watts. So if I'm to leave this running all the time, I'm, it's like leaving a 300 watt light bulb running. But should I need it, it's a quick way of getting the, uh, the surface of the pond thawed without having to use a hammer. So this. We'll float upside down right now. The cord has been coiled up for a long time, so it just wants to shrink itself back up. I'll unplug the airstone there. Plug this guy back in. So now we can see on the top of the heater, it's got a red light on. That tells me that the heater's turned on. So as long as that red light's lit, it's using 300 watts. Now, both of these aren't that expensive to buy. But the nice thing is having two systems to keep it uh, safe is a pretty good uh, safety mechanism. If you only rely on one through the middle of winter, and let's say the squirrels do chew the tubes on your air stone, now you could lose all your fish because you didn't notice for a few days. <clears throat> and then when you do notice, you can't thaw the, the ice at all because you haven't got a backup built in. I could also leave a small pump running in the pond or just below the surface. So that 2000 gallon per hour pump I took out, it's a little bit big for that. But if you have an 800 gallon or a 1200 gallon per hour fountain pump, just that pump running will do the same thing as the air stone. So more than one way you could uh, keep the surface thawed. Or 
board I was kneeling on. One thing I hate this time of year is kneeling in wet, soggy dirt. Get all of the things I don't need from out from under the. Uh... I'm gonna plug the air stone back in. I'm just gonna keep the other cord here in case I need it. netting in two several different sizes this has the finer mesh so if you have things like a sunburst locust uh, with those little tiny leaves or service berries um, the coarse mesh netting will let a lot of those leaves fall right through it uh, the finer mesh stops a lot of those little tiny leaves <clears throat> nothing's going to stop spruce needles finer mesh we have in bulk. So this is just a piece I have for, uh, for a sample for this pond. We could cut this as big as we want, but I haven't uh, cut one for my pond to determine how big a piece I need. see on this pond with with the uh, the net pulled not pulled over all of the edges the, the mesh will fall down into the pond so by rights this pond needs a bigger piece of netting or I could lay uh, a piece of wood across to hold it up there's nothing wrong with it sitting on the water surface because if I was to get the six inches of leaves fall off this tree it's going to stretch the mesh and push it right down to the water anyway <clears throat> but for this one I'm probably going to put something running the full length of the pond so that I can make this net a little bit of a tent over it. So at least I, uh, I know a place where I can get a much longer piece. <clears throat> um, and I don't know, I think at this point, uh, we can see that the, the fish are still fairly happy in there. They're swimming about. They're not stressed out at all. There's not a lot you can do for treating any fish diseases this time of year. Um, you, if you did see some fish that were distressed, you may have to keep an eye on them through this time of year because the, uh, the oxygen level in the water is getting reduced. Um, you stop the waterfall. So the environment that they've been used to all winter is now, or all summer is disrupted. If you did have some fish that uh, might succumb to the, the uh, colder temperatures and maybe any, any uh, injuries they had as their immune system gets compromised a bit by this weather, you unfortunately may have to uh, make sure that you monitor the fish so you don't have any that, uh, unfortunately, don't make it. It's better to get them out in the uh, fall than wait till spring to find out that none of them survived it because one didn't make it in, back in September, October. <clears throat> and something else that we'll uh, talk about a little bit later on another video, I talked about possibly servicing your pumps. So I could show you how to take a couple of the pumps apart. Um, this year, uh, we just received an order from Aquascape uh, last week and like a lot of things this year, a lot of products are back ordered. So I'd like to show you a variety of methods of trying to clean a pump out. One of which is even just using, and not that I'm trying to put in a product plug for Allen's vinegar, but something that will help dissolve the calcium that builds up on the pump is all you really need. Maybe a toothbrush and a screwdriver, a wrench, depends on how your pump's put together. But uh, a little preventative maintenance in the fall before you put your pump away can go a long way for when you're ready in the spring to just plug it in. It's disappointing when you're spending all that time in the spring to get it all cleaned out, plug your pump in, and nothing happens because the calcium is solidified in the pump over the winter time. And now you, you really have to break the pump practically to get it apart. Um, whether you leave your pump dry or wet through the winter, 
Um, if you leave it wet with a little bit of that debris on it, it's probably going to survive better. Um, or you can clean it completely and get all that calcium off it. There's nothing wrong with it sitting dry. Uh, they do sit in the store dry and they sit in Aquascape's warehouse dry all year long. <clears throat> so a pump sitting dry is not a bad thing for it. Um, alternately, we could have left this entire thing running all winter. So we would still do some of the winterizing the same. Um, I would still put the pond heater in. I would still put the aerator in because heaven forbid I have a plumbing or a power failure through the winter time and uh, the pond stops running. The pump itself helps keep the water from freezing because it's uh, as long as the water keeps moving, it won't freeze. So hopefully if you do have a power failure, it's not for very long, but you do have to keep an eye on your pond in the winter time if you leave it running. If the, if the power goes out or the water starts getting low because of ice buildup, you may actually have to add water to your pond midwinter. <clears throat> so we probably have Probably 50% of our customers that we service ponds for leave them running all year long. So it's a toss up whether it's uh, less work to leave it running and clean it up in the spring or to winterize it and have less cleanup in the spring perhaps. So hopefully you found some of that helpful. And if you have any questions, please feel free to call us at the store. Uh, if there's some products that we can help you uh, acquire to help you with this, that would be great. And if you leave it too late and you don't want to go out in the snow, we will happily come out uh, and do it for you. We will really try hard to keep a smile on our face, even though it's snowing out and we're winterizing a pond. So with that, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, hopefully your fish are all there to see you in the spring. <laughs>